Good morning. Morning. What a morning already. Yeah. Um, I'm sitting because I have a few health issues. So sorry if you can't see me. Um, I'm not that great to look at anyway. It'll be fine. You can hear me anyway. Um, but no, I'm just. I just wanted to be very aware today that we've, we're celebrating this baptism and we're celebrating the day that we call Palm Sunday. Um, Jesus was an amazing, wonderful saviour. And on Palm Sunday, the crowd had really started to spot who he was. They'd been seeing him, they'd been watching him, and they were here with this celebratory entrance. He was coming in to Jerusalem. He knew, and we now know, what was going to be happening when he got to Jerusalem. He was going to die on a cross for the salvation of the world. But at that point, they didn't quite get what, what on earth was going on. They just knew that they really, really liked him and they were looking to him as some kind of saviour. So I'm just going to read a little bit from Mark chapter 11. Um, as he came close to Jerusalem, they, which is the crowd that were with him, took out palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. That's what they were calling out. Jesus was on a donkey and he was riding this last bit of the journey into Jerusalem, as I said, knowing exactly what was coming, but he was there on this donkey. And the people following him were shouting this word, Hosanna. Now we use the word Hosanna as a praise word often, but there was a slightly different depth to the word in this context. And it was them saying, help me, save me. That's what they were calling out, save me, Hosanna. There was, there was limits with praise and asking for salvation. We're not entirely sure what they wanted saving from. They may have looked at Jesus as if it was like a military rescue operation because the Romans, it was a difficult time for them politically. So they were, they were in this political regime that they didn't like and they were looking for someone to take them out of it. So they may well have thought he was coming in as that kind of king. But one thing is for certain, they were looking to Jesus for the help. They were looking to this guy to rescue them. They liked him, they liked what they'd seen, and they'd seen so much during his ministry. There'd been about three years of him actually being very evidently active as God on earth. He, they'd seen him heal sick people, they'd seen him show love to people which are, were often the marginalized, the ones that other people didn't show that much love to. They heard him talk about the forgiveness of the father, and they saw him show compassion after compassion after compassion. People encountered the presence of God when they were with Jesus. They didn't necessarily know that that was what was happening, but they were drawn to him. And he spoke what we now call the good news, the good news. He talked of repentance, he talked of changes, lives just like Tegan today, lives changed around, lives being seeing him for who he is, lives being rescued. And he talked particularly to the leaders at the time, the religious leaders, against hypocrisy. He was not up for hypocrisy. So much more, but this is what the people had witnessed. This is who they were following. This is who they were calling out, save us, save us, Hosanna. And, they, and the Roman leaders were starting to get twitchy because this was a little bit of a fear for them that they were maybe seeing anarchy. They were seeing this uprising. They were seeing people just following this guy, calling out to him. So they were twitchy. They were wondering, what on earth are we going to do about this? And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, did not like Jesus at all. He was standing against some of their ways, particularly where they were hypocritical, particularly where they lauded it over people with intellectual somersaults about scripture, trying to make scripture complicated. They placed themselves above people and looked down on people. Well, Jesus just didn't do that. And he was not into that in any way. He was a servant leader, hugely servant. And he mixed with every kind of people, every kind of person. And often, as I said before, those that were considered to be on the margins, those that were not the in crowd, he would hang out with them. He simplified the scriptures rather than complicated them. And he found ways to explain things in, in languages people could understand. There's a guy called Tyler Staten, and he wrote a book, wrote a book called I've given it to so many people, you all probably read it. Um, praying like monks and living like fools. 
And, he, and one thing he says in there is Jesus is intentional. No, I'll say that again. He's intentional and interruptible. You can see where I went wrong with my word there. He's intentional and interruptible. And you know what? When I read that, it's really stuck with me. Jesus is intentional and interruptible. And I was like, is he? Yes, yes, he is. Yes. I, I was just thinking about it. A moment in his ministry, Jesus was massively into praying to spend time with his father, evidently. He needed to be with his, with his father. He encouraged people to pray. Yeah. One time, he needed to just get away from the crowds and get to a quiet place. It's because his cousin and his friend, really close, John, had been beheaded. And he was just grieving for a family member loss. He was in pain and he was with the crowds and he said, I just need to get away to a quiet place. And he did. He headed off for the quiet place. He was intentional about getting to a quiet place. He's always intentional about praying with his father. But when he was getting closer to the quiet place, what happened was he saw crowds and the, and the disciples were saying, hey, guys, hey, Jesus, there's lots of people hanging around here. And the crowds were gathering because they wanted to be with him. I don't know about you, but at that point, I don't think I would have been very keen to spend any time with them. I think I would have been very keen to express my intention, rightly so, to go and have some space and go and be with my father. But no, Jesus showed compassion on them, the Bible says, and he healed the sick. When Jesus saw the crowds, he was intentionally going to pray and he was interrupted by them. He was interrupted by his compassion for them. Not only did he heal the sick, he also spotted they got no food. And actually these guys had houses, they could have gone off to get their own food, but it was another layer of compassion. He did a miracle with fish and bread, some of us have heard of that before, and in effect Jesus cut into his intentional time to go and be with his father for very good reasons. He was interrupted for a picnic, to show compassion on those around him. This is the Jesus that these guys were saying, Hosanna, 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 save us. There's something about you, Jesus. He intentionally on Palm Sunday came as a king, but a humble king. Kings usually came into Jerusalem. Caesars had come before him. The kings that they were looking towards, the political kings had come before him. The royal kings had come with chariots, they'd come on stallions, not a donkey, and they would come triumphantly and they would have servants and they would have slaves going before them, they'd have um, heirs around them, um, either side of them, and there would be a sacrifice and it would be a sacrifice of a bull. It was a big show, ostentatious, huge. And it was symbolizing that Caesar's wealth, it was symbolizing that Caesar was great, symbolizing that Caesar was king, everything was going well. That's the kind of entry into Jerusalem these people normally saw. And here on Palm Sunday, they were seeing Jesus. Every one of these symbols, in one way or another, he changed to be, look, I'm humbly your king. I'm humbly your servant. I ride a donkey, not a stallion. Every one of them. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that this praise, this calling out to him, everything that was happening at that moment wasn't going to last because he knew that the authorities were going to declare him to be a problem that needed to be got rid of. He knew what was happening when he got to Jerusalem. And he knew that not a bull was going to be sacrificed, but himself. So Jesus started this route to Passover. What was happening in Jerusalem was this Passover feast and he was heading that way. And he started in Galilee, he went through Jericho and he went to Jerusalem. And so there's this long route, as it were, to Jerusalem, to where he was definitely going to die. And he knew that because he knew that before the creation of the world. He knew what was going to happen on that day. So on this journey, he, I, I think this interrupted kept happening. He was interruptible because he was, had this intention to get to Jerusalem and he was interrupted along the way. What, on the route there, one occasion, 10 lepers. Now lepers were classed as the lowest of the low of the low. They were not people to mix with and Jesus showed compassion on them and he healed them. His intention to get to Jerusalem interrupted by the lepers who needed his compassion. 
another time on the same journey. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. There was a blind man called Bartimaeus, and he called out to Jesus. He asked him to interrupt his journey for him. He said, Jesus, um, no, sh show mercy on me. He called out, show mercy on me. And Jesus said to him, and I always find this interesting, he asked him what he wanted to do. If I saw a blind man, I think I'd guess. But Jesus asked him, he said, what do you want me to do for you? And he asked for healing and Jesus healed him. Another interruption. So then I was pondering, what do you want me to do for you? If Jesus asks that question to a blind man on his road to Jerusalem, maybe he asks that to us today. I was listening to a lady um, who I really respect called Jill Weber. She's written a book called Even the Sparrow. And she was being interviewed by, on a panel. You know, like when, they, when the interviewer asks this, like, and what do you want Jesus to do for you in your next season of life? And they were all answering in really clever ways and different things. And they were all good. They, they, nothing was bad with what they were saying. But she just said, really paused and just sat there. It was like that pregnant pause that everyone's a little bit. Mm. And she just. To be love. To be love. And I was like. Do you mean to love someone? No, no, to be love. That's all she said. The disciples asked Jesus once, what's the greatest command that you've got out of all of them? And he said to love, to love God and love one another. We can overcomplicate this Christian faith just as the Pharisees were doing. And if we miss out love, we are definitely missing something. If we miss out being interruptible with our intention for Jesus, for the sake of others, if we miss out spotting the needs of others around us, we've missed something. Another time on Jesus' route to Jerusalem, he was interrupted by his friend Lazarus. Lazarus had died and the family were mourning and they were calling on Jesus to come. He went slightly off route and he came and he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, that's a miracle, isn't it? Some of Jesus' followers who were here on the road in Palm Sunday, waving their palms, palm branches, had seen that. And that's why they were there. They had followed what they had seen. They had seen what he'd done for Lazarus. And there they were shouting, Hosanna, save me. Hosanna, save me. Many people in this room today, including Tegan, have called out, Jesus, save me. Spotted him along the way, spotted him in the lives of others, spotted him in all different ways, listened about him and got interested and then called out, save me. And here on Palm Sunday, the crowds were doing just that. And they were outside of the walls of Jerusalem. This was very intentional from Jesus. He was with the ordinary people in ordinary places. He wasn't in the Holy Temple. He was where the people were on the road and they found a savior this guy on a donkey that's who they were calling out to there's another follower of, of jesus called luke who wrote another account of this and he said that the crowds were so noisy shouting praise that the pharisees told jesus to tell him to shut up and he was like nah if i tell them to shush the rocks will cry out the rocks will worship me he just knew that that was his moment where people were going to be worshiping him even the rocks. If we stop worshipping guys, creation itself will start worshipping him. The Romans and the religious people really didn't like this. They were standing aloof, they were watching what was going on, they're proud, and they were seeing this guy on a donkey. And if this was true, what he was saying, they were just felt very threatened by this message. And some people get threatened by Jesus' message. They were the ones that were in this place of hierarchy. They were the religious ones. They were the ones telling people how to get close to God. They were the ones. But Jesus made a strange thing happen. He made culture change. And if we look around at our culture, do any of us think that maybe culture needs to change? But he wasn't in the temple. He was on the streets. When culture sees the real deal, it is always ready for Jesus. I heard that line recently. When culture sees the real deal, it is always ready for Jesus. There's been a couple of thousand 
years since Jesus was around and every time culture has spotted Jesus for who he is, there's been a change in culture. So, UK, a recent poll said 30% of population said that they do believe in Jesus. They do. They believe in God. They would say that they were Christians. That's, that's, a, that's a third, roughly. A third of all people in the UK. But only around 5% of them are in church. 5% of the population are in church. Guys, whatever the reason for this is, and I reckon we could probably have a debate all day, and people have lots and lots of strong opinions as to why they're not in church. Whatever the reason is, people like Jesus. There's, there's recent films and TV series. Anyone heard of The Chosen? Guess how many people? Guess how many people have watched The Chosen? 108 million people have watched this depiction of Jesus in 600 different languages. People are interested in Jesus. 108 million people willingly watching a depiction of Jesus. This doesn't show a lack of interest. People like Jesus. Jesus is love. He is intentional. He tells us what the priorities are and he stuck to those priorities himself. And he's interruptible. To be present with his presence is something that we've been saying here for a while now. And we genuinely believe that that's our call by God is to be here, to be present, to be present with the people, to be present at drop-ins, to be present at fun days, to be present with God's presence. When we're here, he's here. He's here without us too, guys, but he's here when we're here. And one of these things is, it, it's, it's just really been stirring on my mind that we really do need to get hold of this, to be present with his presence in the culture that we're living, in this community, with our friends and our family and with our workplaces, we are present with his presence everywhere we are. We are with the people who will be interested in Jesus. We are with people who in the culture are looking for something to save them. They're looking for someone to say, Hosanna, save me. They know that they're in a rut. People are often aware that their situation doesn't look great. But they're not turning to churches right now. Again, debate that why. But they are looking to Jesus. Are we willing to be present with his presence? We must never underestimate what God does. He rocks up. Just by humbling ourselves and praying intentionally for him to move, he does things. People have been saying around here that since we've been here, since we've been praying for the area, I believe, the atmosphere is changing. Now, we can't make that happen. Only God can make that happen. So if Jesus was to say, what would you like me to do for you personally and as a church? I wonder what we would say. This Easter, we are doing a load of stuff to be present with his presence. You've seen the flyers. <laughs> a chance to be interrupted, a chance to be love, a chance to be compassionate, and a chance to be with the people, with the crowds. Maybe people are ready for the real deal. Maybe people are calling out just like Tegan has today. Maybe like on Palm Sunday, this culture, honestly, to live in this culture right now, I've only said the other day, I don't know how people can do this without God. I don't know how people can do life without God. Often people are looking for something to help them. Are we ready to pray with people? Are we ready to grieve with people? Are we ready to eat with people? Are we ready to love people, face paint people? However bad you are, you're still welcome. All the way on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus was both intentional and interruptible. Are we? Are we intentional and are we interruptible? Jesus showed love, mercy and compassion. So as soon as he got to Jerusalem, Jesus intentionally caused some chaos within the temple because he got there and he said to the religious people, just stop it. Stop this. Stop hypocrisy. Stop stealing off the poor in the name of religion. Stop making it difficult. He said, my house will be a house of prayer. Come to me to pray, not to make it a den of robbers. Jesus spoke very intentionally to the religious people of the day as well. And he was angry. He was rightly angry about how people had messed this up. This good news story was somehow becoming a hierarchy and for the elite. 
As a church, let's always be intentional with putting God first. Let's always be praying. Let's always be worshipping him. If we stop worshipping, the rocks will cry out, right? We want, to be, we want to be bigger than the rocks. We want to pray. It's all about him, but let's also be interruptible, ready to engage. We sing a song, sometimes called Break My Heart. It's got the line in it, Break My Heart for What Breaks Yours. And as I was thinking about this talk today, I was thinking, if I'm to ask you, if Jesus was asked to ask me what he'd want me to do, what, he'd, what I'd want him to do for me, maybe would I dare to say break my heart for what breaks yours? I don't think I could cope with it. But what breaks Jesus' heart? Are we asking him? Are we ready to be servants like him? So today you may be sitting there and you may well be sitting there thinking, well, thank you very much, Helen. But you don't know just how hard my life is right now. And if only you knew, you'd be doing a very different talk this morning. What about me? Why am I even here today? I didn't really want to come. And as I was preparing, I felt that God said, there's going to be some people in the room who genuinely didn't want to come today. Tell them that they're welcome and I'm glad they came. That's what I felt. I felt that God was saying, it's so good to see you. If, if you think that church is expecting a well-presented, all-together person, and you're not that, maybe you know you've got stuff going on in your own life, and maybe you don't feel worthy. It's Jesus that makes you welcome. It's Jesus that makes you acceptable to him. He is the one that knew what was happening when he died and he rose again for all of us. He is the one who is willing and ready to save us. He died for us, every one of us. Palm Sunday, he was facing this imminent death and he, and he just was there for the people. So today we celebrate Tegan and we, um, I just want to read those words from that song that she chose. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to a family and your blood flows through my veins. I love that line. You split the sea so I can walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. What a day to be baptised, Tegan. The day that we remember Jesus intentionally coming, ready to be interrupted. The crowd spotting who he was him knowing what was going on next and him being a humble servant for those who would call on him. What an amazing day. Thank you, God. So I'm just going to pray for us. Are the children coming in? So can someone ask the children to make their way? Okay, let's pray. So Father, I just felt that you were speaking to us today. I felt that you were calling out the ones who may not feel welcome, may not feel like they should be here, to say, I, I am welcoming you. Father, if that's, if that's from you, I pray, Lord, that you bring your peace. I pray, I thank you for everything you did on Palm Sunday. I thank you for the journey there. I thank you that you interrupted your journey to raise lives, <laughs> to heal the sick, I thank you that in your ministry you even were interrupted in your own grief to feed people like a picnic. You are a servant king and we give you the glory for who you are today. Father, if there's hearts here that don't yet know you, I pray that you continue to do a work in, in people's lives. And for those of us who do, I pray, Lord, that you would um, stir us up again to be present with your presence in everywhere we are, knowing that you are with us, knowing that we can be interruptible for the sake of you. I pray, Lord, for our hearts.
I pray, Lord, that we would be close to you, intentional with our relationship with you, and ready to share the good news of you at any point of our life. Father, would you give us compassion and would you help us to show mercy? In your name, Jesus. Amen.